Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks to being here. This is uh, the IAU Symposium 367, Education and Heritage of uh, Astronomy in the Era of Big Data. And um, this is our last day. It's uh, an amazing thing because it was a very hard uh, week and very intensive and with a very nice uh, invited talks and uh, oral contributions and a very good exchange between the participants. Uh, today and um, uh, this part of the day is, is an special moment because I think you uh, noticed that uh, it's a, a day of uh, women. Almost all the speakers at the first part of the day are women. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, if you permit me, we will start with the first uh, invited talk of the day. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce the speaker, who is Karen Halber. Is not uh, just a colleague, uh, but also a friend. So thank you very much, Karen, to be here. Please open your camera if you want. Uh, Karen uh, holds a PhD uh, in physics from the Balseiro Institute uh, in Bariloche. So she also lives in Bariloche, but now is not there. And uh, is a principal researcher of the Argentinian Council of uh, Science and Technology, the CONICET, uh, working at Bariloche Atomic Center. And is a professor of, uh, at the Balseiro Institute, um, which depends on the Argentinian Commission of uh, Atomic Energy and also the University of Cusho in Mendoza. She has been awarded the 2019 L'Oreal UNESCO International Award for Women in Science for Latin America. So Karen, the stage, the stage is all, all yours and thank you very much to be here with us. Uh, good morning, Beatriz. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Beatriz, and the organizers of this important symposium for the invitation. I was very, I felt very honored when you invited me several months ago. In fact, I think it was last year. So it's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, and with, with all of you talking about these uh, issues, very important issues of women in science in in general. Um, I, in, in this moment, I am in Las Grutas. Las Grutas is on the Atlantic coast in the province of Rio Negro, and we, came, we arrived here last night quite late from Bariloche because we came here to see the eclipse, to watch it on Monday. So I'm so sorry, all of you who are not here in Argentina who could not come, uh, won't be here, and, and this is not, I'm not in presence talking to you, but I really hope, hope we, can, we can meet sometime in the near future. Um, well, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the topic of, of women in science in general. I'm very happy today we have so, so many women uh, speakers at this symposium. Uh, so this is excellent. And this is not a usual case as you'll see in, in a second. So let me, let me convey to you some ideas uh, that worry me a lot. And uh, I'll tell you some examples, uh, uh, some reflections. And uh, the, the main message is that we really need a deep uh, cultural change. We know that, but it's taken time and uh, the things are moving too slowly, but uh, I'm optimistic and I think things could change. And, and it, it depends on us and, and of course on the whole society. Um, I, I have many uh, stories to tell if, if, when, when during my career, uh, I, I had to face many problems that in that moment, maybe they were not, uh, I, I didn't see them as problems, but now reflecting on that, this is something that well, it happened to me and it does happen to maybe many other, uh, women and young, many, mainly young women in science. Uh, for example, once I was at my postdoc and in Germany, and I was writing my first uh, single authored paper, and uh, I gave it, handed it out to my colleague, uh, saying, "Let's see, tell me what, what do you think about this?" My male colleague, and he said, "Well, the paper is very nice. I think it has chances. It, 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 it will be published, but I think I suggest you to write uh, your your initials and not your full name." So, because uh, then you can have more chances that the paper is accepted if they don't realize you're a woman. Uh, and I couldn't believe that he was saying that. Of course, I signed the paper with my full name. Uh, but these, these are small things that happened. Uh, another time I was at a conference 
uh, no, I was invited to give a talk at an institution uh, abroad from Argentina. And uh, after the talk, my, the, my colleague who had invited me said, your talk was very nice, very orderly, very uh, rational and very logic. You seem to think like a man. <laughs> this was several years ago in 2000, beginning of the 2000s. Um, so, so this is, um, let, let me show you now some, uh, a photo, I will share the screen with you. Um, so I'll share this. Uh, uh, in, the beginning, in the beginning of this year, I was invited also to give a talk at a conference in, um, uh, in Benasque in, in Spain. It was a workshop on, on entanglement and strongly correlated systems. This is my, my area of research. And, uh, and then, uh, well, as you see, there, there's a bunch of people, about 55 participants, out of which we can only uh, count five women, and here they're in, in yellow. So, I mean, this is nothing new for most of you. I mean, this is a current situation in many uh, symposiums, many, uh, many uh, meetings. Uh, so five women out of 55 participants, this is uh, uh, 10 plus less than 10%. And uh, this is a situation that has to change. So this, where is Vilma? Where are the women in, in, in science? Why is it that we have such few uh, uh, women in, in science? Uh, this is, um, uh, this could be, uh, the, this story I was telling you about what happened to me could be the story of many young women in STEM careers, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I invite you to look around, uh, like in this case of my conference, uh, and, and to see uh, really, uh, that what, uh, what a few amount of women are, are around. Uh, women are not only a minority, but they are far from being protagonists in, in policy making. And uh, very, uh, there are very few exceptions and men continue uh, to dominate the field. Um, we, we know uh, UNESCO uh, reported the amount of the statistics that uh, worldwide less than 30% of researchers are women. Uh, but this includes all fields. It also includes uh, medicine, biology, uh, social sciences. So if imagine, if, including all scientific fields, is less than 30%. Imagine if we concentrate in STEM fields, this number is much lower, but we do not have that number. But so, so one can assure that uh, we have much less than 30% of women in STEM careers as researchers <clears throat> worldwide. Um, Let's look, for example, at the, the numbers we know. There are very few women who got uh, uh, Nobel Prizes in science. Uh, but let's look at the numbers. The, the numbers are really astonishing. We only have 12 women in physiology and medicine. This is uh, updated to so this year, uh, out of 210 men. We have four women in physics. Of course, this year, um, Andrea Guest got a Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, but 212 men got the Nobel Prize in Physics. We have two women in economy out of 82 men, seven women in chemistry of 179 men. In total, we have 25 women that won the Nobel Prize in science uh, out of three, 683 men. Uh, if we look in mathematics, uh, the um, uh, in the Fields Medal, uh, only Maria Mirsakani got it. Uh, out of 60 uh, prizes, or the Abel Prize in Mathematics, uh, sorry, or Fields Prize, and in the Abel Prize this year, current, uh, last year, Karen Ullenbeck got it among 20 recipients. Uh, so this is really striking, and it shows that as a society, we evidently are, we are facing uh, a problem which we must face as a whole. Um, the question is, do we need to change the situation? Um, why we could ask. I mean, maybe women have different preferences, maybe we think differently, maybe we have a different brain. According to several uh, reliable and recent publications on the topic, there is mounting evidence that the brain is not gendered, uh, not more, I would say, uh, than the heart, the kidneys, or, or the liver. But it is a well-established myth that women's brains are more uh, capable the wild for empathy and intuition and men's male brains are supposed to be optimized for action and for, for reason and for logic. We don't even know what consciousness is, how we reason, how we store information, and we're looking for differences between women's and men's brains. 
This has been dubbed neurosexism by Gina Ripon in her book, uh, The Gendered Brain, where she states that only a gendered society uh, will produce a gendered mind. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, topic to reflect on and, uh, uh, and, and, and really think about if uh, we are really going to ask ourselves the question uh, if, the gene, if the brain is really gendered. Um, others have uh, stated the, that, um, or they argue that we have different perspectives and that it is important to have more women in science to increase diversity. Uh, yes, of course, diversity is important and inclusion of different perspectives that is good for science. However, uh, there is more diversity between men stemming from different cultures than between men and women in a society in general. So this argument is valid, the argument of diversity. When one is discussing cultural and um, uh, cultural reach and inclusion uh, of, of modern science, but not for gender specific issues. There's no reason whatsoever that there shouldn't be a equal participation and a parity of women and men in science and technology in all fields. The fact that there is such an enormous gap uh, is a strong warning that we still have serial, serious cultural, social, economic, and political biases. Uh, and the burden should not put only on, the, on, on women's shoulders, but on society in general, uh, on our culture and on uh, political structure. Um, well, of course, there have been uh, women uh, that have paved the way, paved the way for other women to follow through. That have challenged the system and have made, and that have made uh, history in science. And I'd like to pay tribute to some of those women who have who have paved the way, paved the way for other women to follow. So let me mention. Um, let me mention three of uh, these uh, women because I think they're inspirational. I hope and I'm sure they inspire other women to follow. Um, they lived in, in different moments. Uh, one is, uh, you know, surely you know about her, Caroline Lucretia Herschel. Um, she was uh, a pioneer at her time because uh, she was born in Hanover in Germany in, in 1750. She was an educated woman who would catalog stars and nebula and discover comets, including the periodic comet, the 35P Herschel Rigolet, which bears her name. She was the first woman astronomer to earn a salary. She used to earn 50, 50 pounds a year, which is equivalent to 6,400 pounds a year in 2020. Uh, so 6,400 6, pounds as an assistant to her brother. Uh, uh, the astronomer William Herschel, who discovered Uranus in 1781, and which he mistook for a comet. She worked with his brother, with her brother uh, William, um, throughout her, her whole career. She was the first woman in England, because she was born in Germany, but then moved to England and worked there with her brother. She was the first woman in England to hold a government position. The first woman to publish scientific findings in the Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society and to be awarded a gold of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1828, and also to be named an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1835 with Mary Somerville. Uh, she was also named an honorary member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1838. The King of Prussia presented her with a gold medal for science on the occasion of her 96th birthday in 1846. Uh, so, um, so uh, Caroline Lucretia Herschel was recognized in her time, but she was uh, one of the very, very few women uh, doing science in general in that moment. In 1802, however, the Royal Society published Caroline's catalog in its Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society uh, under William's name. So the catalog she had uh, worked mainly on, of course, it was in collaboration with William, but she, she wasn't, it wasn't even under her name. Uh, with her brother, she discovered over 2,400 astronomical objects over 20 years. The asteroid uh, 281 Lucretia uh, was named, discovered in 1888, was named after Caroline's second name, Lucretia. And the crater C. Herschel on the moon bears her name. So there is a crater that I'm showing here that bears her name. There's also a crater uh, uh, who has 
her brother's name, uh, Herschel, which is much bigger. Um, the telescopes they polished, they were made, they were the best in, in their time, in the 1800s. So uh, a tribute to Caroline Herschel. Of course, I mean, we're contemporary with Jocelyn uh, Ben Burnell, Dame uh, Burnell. She, uh, probably many of you know her personally, but uh, she's very, very uh, relevant uh, in, in astronomy. Uh, she was born in Northern Ireland, and uh, as a postgraduate student, she discovered the, face, the first radio pulsars in 1967. She found um, a signal which was pulsing with great regularity at a rate of about one pulse every uh, one and a third second. So every, every second and a little bit more, uh, she found this uh, very strange and periodic signal, um, radio signal. They, they thought in the beginning it was um, some extraterrestrial artificial intelligence, uh, I mean, an, an intelligent signal because it was so periodic. And uh, they, she named it LGM, which stands for Little Green Man, uh, <laughs> thinking it was something, some, uh, uh, some signal of extraterrestrial life. Um, and now it is known, uh, this source is known as the PC, PSR B1919 plus 21. Uh, it was identified several years later as a rapidly rotating neutron star. <clears throat> Sorry. This discovery, let me show you here. The, this is, uh, I was very impressed to see this because in her paper published in Nature in, in 1968, um, Probably you see here the, the signals here, this periodic signal as a function of time. Here we have uh, seconds on the x axis. And, uh, and this is a paper in which she, she is a second author. <clears throat> she was um, as a postgraduate student, and um, she was her, her advisor was the first author. So the title of this paper was Observation of Rapidly Pulsating Radio Talk. Um, I think it's very impressive to see uh, really what a small signal, but how they uh, discovered this in, in the huge amount of radio signals they were, they were observing. And she was uh, acute and enough to be able to distinguish this um, very periodic signal uh, coming from them uh, afterwards recognized as a rapidly rotating neutron star. Um, <clears throat> in um, uh, this discovery was recognized by, uh, by the award of the 1974 Nobel Prize in Physics, but as here you see, despite being in the original paper uh, and being the first person to discover the pulses, because she's the one who detected them, she was not one of the re recipients of, of the prize. In 2018, she was awarded uh, however, the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, a very important recognition uh, for her discovery of these radio pulses. And following the announcement of the award, she decided to, to donate and to give the whole of the 2.3 million pounds prize money to help female, minority, and refugee students um, seeking to become physics researchers. It's called the Bell Burnell Graduate Scholarship Fund. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jocelyn, for all your contributions to science. So uh, finally, I would like to mention, of course, uh, Andrea Guess. Andrea Guess is an American astronomer. Uh, she was born in 1965, and um, she was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics this year. Um, working at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California at Los Angeles. Uh, her research focuses on the center of the Milky Way galaxy. In 2020, she became the fourth uh, woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, shared also with Gensel and with Penrose. For the discovery of a supermassive compact object, now generally recognized as a black hole in the center of the Milky Way's galaxy, um, which has a, a mass of 4.1 million solar masses. Uh, the, she used and uh, developed and used uh, very important, um, uh, very precise uh, telescopes, and uh, they, they developed a very, very precise way of measuring uh, or looking at through uh, the Milky Way into the center of the Milky Way. Here, you see an image which I think is very impressive because uh, one can see uh, the 
uh, spatial distribution of the objects that were measuring from different experiments too. And here this plus is the center of the galaxy. You can see how blurred all the images are, but these are the very, very, this precision allowed them to see the rotation of stars and, uh, around the supermassive object in the center of the galaxy. Karen, um, two minutes. The, um, see, two minutes, yes, yes I'm, about, I'm about to finish. Uh, the, um, the Apollo program uh, landings when she was young inspired Gay to aspire to be the first female astronaut and her mother encouraged, encouraged her to that goal. So I also thank you, Andrea, for all your contributions to science. So yes, I'm, I'm about to finish. Um, there is still um, an enormous uh, cultural barrier that keep many girls from, from science and also girls and boys stemming from different and, or less advantaged or discriminated uh, backgrounds or sectors of society. Uh, we are witnessing an important moment in history concerning women's rights and empowerment in all fields. However, uh, although the situation has improved uh, a lot, you know, some, somewhat it has improved, there's still a long way to go. Um, the, compared to half a century ago, the situation is evidently much better, uh, but, but we're, really, uh, we're really far from it. And you can see that in the numbers I gave at the beginning. The past must be paved to include all the talent we're missing and to allow anyone to choose a scientific career without having to. Uh, to to uh, go through uh, important barriers, and this is what, what's still happening now. We definitely need uh, cultural change, and uh, because mainly it is a question of um, of justice, uh, of non discrimination, and of equal opportunities. So I'm optimistic, and uh, I, I really think things could change, but it depends on all of society not only on women. And uh, thank you about Beatriz again and the organizers of this symposium to include this very important topic uh, to be discussed among all of us. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, Karen, for your inspiring talk. It was very good. Thank you, really, because I know you are a busy woman. And um, we had for a moment a couple of questions, uh, some comments. Um, uh, the first one is about uh, what about the black women and the LGBT um, people totally under underrepresented? What's your opinion about that? If it is at the same level that the, the women? No, I think I think the situation is still worse. It's worse than the situation of of uh, non-black or or. or uh, or, or women that are not from uh, those communities, for example, or, or identified uh, as so. That's why people talk about about gender problems uh, in general, not to uh, talk about a bipolar polar society. Uh, people are people. We're persons. We're scientists, and uh, uh, there is evidently there is a bias because uh, not only black women uh, in Argentina, for example, we have very few. Um, uh, students in science that come, as, as I mentioned in my talk, from uh, other sectors of society, so um, less wealthy or, or, not, or vulnerable, vulnerable sectors of society, um, you see it everywhere. And uh, this is not only women, but also young boys. Uh, so there are, uh, the, we still have a, a big bias in our representation. We're, we're talking a lot about women in physics, but it's really more of a gender problem. So I completely agree with the person who, who asked the question. Um, we still have a long way to go in that sense. Uh, you have another another question by Elena Cipollone, it's a, a YouTube channel, uh, and she said, um, uh, wouldn't it make sense also to, to, to look at the figures of, no, of Nobel laureates, uh, women in literature, for example, to put in the, in the same uh, well, list yes. that you, you made? Well, I, I understand, yes, of course, in, in other fields, uh, we also have uh, underrepresentation of, of women. I only mentioned women in STEM or in science. I also included economy because so it's more in, in the verge of science, but also applications to society. Uh, 
because we're talking about this in, in this meeting, but uh, the discrimination of women is in, in, in every field, everything, in, 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 the, in companies, in governments, in, in other fields of science. I agree, yes. What, if you look at it, I mean, they're also underrepresented. Not so much. There are more, somewhat more women, also in the Peace Prize, for example, women activists. But there, there's, in all fields, we are very, uh, very few women, and things have to change. Uh, a question by Jose Gomez. What, go, uh, what could be the first step to solve the gender problem? No, um, there's not only one step to solve. I, I, as I say, I think it's a general problem. It, I think it's mainly a cultural problem, but it has to be dealt by, by not only by women, because there are many groups of women talking about women's problems and the women in, in science, for example. But however, I mean, these, these groups are okay because some, some things can arise that uh, it only arise in women's groups, but this is something that concerns the whole of society, also, also men, men and women, also governments, uh, society as, as a whole. So there's not only one step, I think, uh, but the main thing behind it is respect for everybody and the recognition that within our differences, we're all part of a human, of human being. And this is something that has to be deeply rooted into the culture. And this is something that has to change. Uh, I have a question. How confident are the surveys about the situation of the women in the, on the planet? Are confident, we, yeah, you, the results, are confident or not, or there is a bias? No, I don't know if there is a bias, Beatrice, but the UNESCO, you know, if you look at it, if you dig into the data, you see that it's very difficult to collect data from, from the whole world. I mean, some societies, I mean, for example, Saudi Arabia or, 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 or other countries or that, are, that have, don't have uh, good statistics. We in Argentina, for example, we don't have very good statistics. We do have something, but we're far from having it. So the, the first step to, to analyze uh, the a problem is to have good statistics. And um, it, it, for example, at the UNESCO international level, it, it is complicated. And if you look, some countries, they give statistics in, with, with a certain weight of some data, some give other weight. And if you want to discriminate in, um, in STEM careers, uh, it's very difficult because some countries do it, but not all. So that's why we have this number, which is just below 30%. But it includes all sciences because they ask the countries. For example, Argentina gives them numbers that includes all sciences. Conicet has just over 50% researchers, which are female, and that includes all sciences in Conicet. And these are the numbers Argentina gives UNESCO. So this is how um, uh, I realized that UNESCO includes all sciences. I, I would be very good for UNESCO to, to, to do the same exercise, but with STEM uh, professionals or STEM areas. And uh, what about the culture? Because uh, the surveys are, uh, are uh, standards, are a standard surveys, but uh, each country has a different problem. So what do you think? Uh, is better a, a, a universal uh, survey of the status of the women or we need uh, more, uh, more connected with, uh, with each country, each culture um, yes. to have yes. a better, a I better think, I think picture? It Yes. So, so uh, to have a universal vision is okay because you have uh, the whole picture of, of the world I and mean, that gives you a first order approximation. But to look at it, at each, each country is, is, is important. For example, if you look at Tunisia, uh, t Tunisia um, uh, has uh, a very, I think it has over 60% of women in physics, for example. And once I was talking to some Tunisian uh, physicists at the ICTP in Trieste, and I said, look how good, I mean, congratulations, you have so many. They said, yes, the pro we have a cultural problem there because um, uh, women physicists are not well paid for and it's not regarded as, a, as, a, as an appropriate profession. So men do not do physics because they, they, they are expected to go to companies, to a private company or to other areas and not in physics. That's why we have so many physicists, women in Tunisia, because it's, it's not considered as a an appropriate profession. And this is something which is culture, and I agree with you. This is something that has to stem out. Bolivia has a similar problem. If you look at Bolivia, there are not so many physicists, and you have a, a, a proportion, a larger amount of women physicists. And this is because also what society, how society regards uh, women in uh, the profession itself. Yes, and uh, what, uh, what is your uh, um, 
your thought about uh, about the situation when the women uh, in general are a uh, uh, available for a um, position of power, uh, a, a high level, and sometimes the the women are against or don't uh, don't uh, accept this position by any reason. Uh, which is your message to the young people about this? About to take the responsibilities and not to uh, doubt about uh, her own. Uh, um, uh, her own uh, uh, good good uh, work or uh, would uh, good uh, position to to accept this position, a decision, a direction, yes, for example. I, yes, it's, I mean what what, what you say. Uh, what, what it, it's really. I mean one one can really realize that in many cases it is a question of self confidence. I mean we are still educating our uh, young. Uh, students since, uh, since from the very beginning uh, in in a in a biased way and it's still there. Of, of course, we're, we're talking about it. We're more conscious about the, the biases we are uh, instilling in, uh, in in our in our young uh, uh, young girls and boys. But uh, I think a question of confidence is very important. It, I think it's fundamental. Uh, and for example, what I, I, I reflected on my career, I think that the confidence I got from many from my family was fundamental for my development. Um, and this is something I didn't get necessarily from my, from my early days at school. And, uh, and I needed this confidence to uh, overcome all these uh, barriers I found during my career. But this is something that shouldn't be so, because we should be able to include women who are, do not have a strong personality uh, and who, sh who can follow their career normally as other men do. Um, because they because they like it and, and not because they're really aiming at uh, at being Olympic or having a, or not getting a Nobel Prize. I mean, they, they they should just be able to follow science because they like it and because they're passionate about it. And uh, and this also concerns uh, uh, having responsibilities. Having a responsibilities it shouldn't be only a question of. Uh, of, of, of gaining a, a position as a woman, but it should be completely taken as normal. Why? Because we also have a right and uh, to to uh, have access to these positions, and uh, and this would be uh, when when we reach parity, this would be a measure of the maturity of our society. And if we don't reach that, it's always a question of how we gain positions. So we are, I think we are in a transitory moment. Uh, where, we, where we have to have some special considerations or this positively discriminative uh, policies. And I think they are good, but given and considering that we are in a transitory position because it shouldn't be there forever. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, the last question, because uh, we have not more time, but is by Corina Lavine. Uh, we make, uh, she said, uh, we make the cakes and the men eat them. Do you agree that it's the uh, same in science? <laughs> uh, well, it, it's a nice metaphor, uh, but sometimes we don't even make the cakes because, uh, I mean, if you see the protagonism of, of men taking decisions and, and, and they are, in, in Argentina, we have a say that we, we cut the fish. Who is cutting the fish? I mean, who's making it? For me, to make the cake is to have the possibility of, of deciding what cake to make, what ingredients to buy, how much, for how many people. And women, they, they very seldom have that possibility of, of taking that decision when it comes to science. So I think we don't even make the cakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, it was a great, uh, a great presentation and uh, well, have a nice, nice uh, Monday with the total solar eclipse. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you all and, and uh, have, a, have a very good uh, symposium. And I think about all of you when I'm watching the eclipse. I really hope you can follow it. Goodbye, thank you very much. goodbye everybody. Thank you very okay. much again. Bye-bye.